Uh, the police have the phones. Uh, running or indicating to his name and elder. See you all the girls for the beginning. Camp director voice. In the radiance of this new day, we humbly seek the, brill seek the brilliance of a guiding light. As we navigate through the intricate paths of service, may wisdom illuminate our steps. Embolden us to recognize the unspoken needs of those we encounter and empower us to be a source of solace. As we extend our hands, may we be guided in our every action. With gratitude in our hearts, we thank you for the opportunity engage our community, and make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. You're the forward, uh, leading the forward test and Pledge of Allegiance to Sonia Augustine. Uh, she's the director of uh, community marketing communications at UNL Med School.
Okay? Great. Thank you all. And especially thank you all, because that's fantastic to bring all those guests. And I would challenge others, you know, that these lunches are so great. I think this speak is also a great group of people. I want to know how old we do or who we are, so don't hesitate to bring in friends you think might be uh, interested in this kind of thing. Uh, I'd like to invite Amy Lou Charlie, President and CEO of uh, the Turtle Industry in Kentucky, and uh, also a chair of the Rotary Foundation Trade. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Service backed up with financial investment is a vital part of our work for this committee, for this, this club specifically, for the Rotary in general. Uh, November is Rotary Foundation Month. We'll be highlighting three of our members who have reached uh, what's called major donor status. The Rory Foundation, by the way, has the highest possible score from charity, charity navigator, 100 of 100 points, that's pretty good, but it's strong financial health and commitment to accountability and transparency is about 1% of charity's value. Okay. Okay. Since it was founded more than 100 years ago, the Rory Foundation has spent more than $4 billion with a on life changing sustainable projects, you all have the polio project, but there are many, many others. Uh, the foundation it transforms the gifts into service projects to change lives both locally, around the, around the state, and around the world. Uh, and district, district grants tend to be you know, regional, local, and global grants can be anywhere in the world with other local clubs. Our club has visited both of these types of grants many, many times over. A major donor recognition, by the way, for this is given to Rotary to cumulative uh, donations to the foundation of at least $10,000. And the, uh, the major donor level two recognition, which we're going to recognize today for this late uh, is uh, between $25,000 and $50,000 over the time. Okay? That's pretty good. Okay, $35,000. It's amazing what the impact we have. So, you know, a lot of money like that over the years affects a lot of people who don't have a chance to make it out of like that. Um, and so, Jimmy, you know, let's give a round of applause to Amy for celebrating you know, her generous investment and to learn level two major donors. That allows us to be what Rotary International calls a 
star plug. So a star plug mm -hmm. means you know you did good, and so you're going to be more eligible for some of that money that goes to the foundation to come back in the form of district grant. So that was what Kevin was talking about that we have a lot of those, and we really want to be a star plug um, every year. So I want to tell you why I give. And, you know, why I started with it in 1995, and I do give to the annual fund every year, and that is the fund that allows some of that money to come back to the district level and be available for grants uh, to us. But my personal priority has always been the Polio Plus project uh, that Rotary has been doing really since 1979. And I know, you know, so those of you who've been Rotarians for quite a while may be thinking, boy, are we ever going to be done with that? It's a long game. And when I started giving in 1995, polio was active in 64 countries. And today, it is two. Pakistan and Afghanistan. So when they say we're this close, we're this close. We're going to get this done. Um, I get to Polio Plus for three reasons. The first reason is polio can come back. Even though Afghanistan and Pakistan are a long way away, just this past Monday, I shook hands with somebody who had just come back from a trip to Pakistan. Okay? Now, we're a lot more familiar with COVID these days. If you could give money to totally get rid of COVID forever, would you do that? We'd all do that, right? Polio was a lot worse than COVID. Uh, a lot of people died of polio, but more often they were paralyzed. And polio particularly targeted those children. That's what was so scary about it. Um, so polio can come back. That's one reason why, why I give. The second reason why I give is because uh, the Gates Foundation will match every dollar that I give to the one. So if I give a dollar, the Gates Foundation gives a dollar. If I give a thousand dollars, the Gates Foundation gives three thousand dollars, and I think that's a pretty good deal. And the third reason I give to the Polio Plus Project is because this is making history. This is only the, this will be only the second disease that's ever been totally eradicated permanently, and it's not too late for all of us to be part of that history making. Um, just to let you know how important Rotary's role has been in the eradication of polio, the Rotary Foundation has, and this is individual Rotarians like you and me, has given two, over $2 billion, $8 billion, toward it. And that's a $10 billion that's been spent. And on top of that $2 plus billion, Rotary has been instrumental in getting the Gates Foundation to come in and getting our government and other countries' governments to put more money for the eradication of polio. So Rotary's role in this cannot be overstated, and Bill Gates himself has said that, has said that about Rotary. So I'm asking each of us to give $100 to the foundation every year, and we're trying to make it easier for you to do that. Uh, when you hear about these call parents, <coughs> that means somebody who's given cumulatively uh, $1,000 or more over time. So you can be a Paul Harris fellow, but we might need to be at least $100 every year. So there's three ways, and I think we've got uh, up here a QR code. That's the first way. You can scan that on the screen. You can donate now. The second way is after today's meeting, we have Larry Sloan and Rick Harnett. They're going to be standing by with computers in case you want them to help you donate online. <laughs> and then third, if you have not given so far in this first year, uh, Delene, later this month, is going to send out an invoice. So we're calling it an invoice <laughs> because this is part of our club service is to give. And so if you want to give that way, just respond to that invoice that will default to $100 that you can change the amount you want to change the amount, and she will take care of it from there on out. But however you give, I'm asking you to support the Rotary Foundation this year and every year at least $100. Thank you. That's great. Uh, one of the things about Bill Gates, by the way, he did an award years ago, about 2005 or six. I don't know if you remember this. 
for basically he took the Microsoft uh, approach and process for figuring capital or other, or other investment kind of projects. He said, let's do the same thing for sharing and giving. How do we measure what's, you know, what's going to happen when we give the money to this campaign? How is it going to be sustained? So how is it going to be actually getting results rather than just giving money and hopefully it can use it I remember this about 2005 or 6 where so many executive directors at the time were talking about how they had to change the way they did their evaluation and they made their growth and they didn't evaluate how can we show that this could have an impact and how can we show that this could be sustainable. One other part of the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates said that they looked, the foundation looked around the whole world for the best charity that worked for this foundation that works most effectively in charitable dollars. The biggest impact is the immediate, but also a long term sustain. He picked the Rolling Foundation, so in their view, they did a lot of due diligence to the best in the entire world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, just an FYI, uh, this Sunday, one of our Rotarians is on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Uh, Whitney Austin, who started Whitney Strong, is going to be on Meet the Press and something else. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the, to the podium now uh, the Roman Fund Board Board Chair, more, more uh, well known as the immediate club, past club presidents, one of the very best presidents we've ever had. All <laughs> <laughs> for, you know, for the seeing the product 
I'm a young man. You're not the product that we see in the newspaper or on the media, but a product of a young man that is a success, not only uh, in his eyes, but in the eyes of those around him. So we are just super excited for you all believing in us and trusting us. Uh, we're, we're extending this to a girls' school. Uh, we're on a, a $11 million campaign right now. We're about $9 million in. And we believe in 2025 that we're going to open the doors for a girls' school. So keep, keep uh, standing by us, supporting us. And uh, if there's anything that we can do, uh, if there's any people we need to talk to, let us know. We'll, we'll be there. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I have a pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Douglas Farrick Jr., the VP of Community Engagement at UofL. Uh, and he's got quite a bio uh, education wise, and I was just talking beforehand. And he also said in a couple of places that are not listed here, and I've been a of them, overseas some of One's called Oxford University, the other one's called Cambridge University. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> but Douglas Farrick currently serves as the Vice President for Community Engagement at UofL. He has a BS in Management Information Systems and an MA in Investment Engineering in Engineering Management from the University of Alabama. He also earned his doctorate degree in higher education and administration from the University of Alabama as well. His primary area of expertise is in community-based participatory research, diversity, equity, and inclusion practices, as well as higher education administration and organization. Great background for what he's doing. Dr. Patchett is passionate about assisting organizations and communities in identifying and implementing effective practices, processes, and procedures that promote better collaboration and teamwork among individuals, teams, and communities. Dr. Patchett enjoys spending time with his wife, Ray, and daughter, Zoe, playing sports and volunteering in the community. He's an advocate in support of the idea of lift as you climb to help and assist in areas of education and social mobility. So good morning again. Uh, pleasure to see some familiar faces. I guess I can know now, but pleasure to see some familiar faces. Before I get started, I just want to shout out all of my U of L colleagues that are here today. Um, it's a pleasure to see each of you. So. I don't know if you want to or not, but if you work for the University of Louisville and you're in this space today, can you just please stand up? Just be recognized. Yeah, indeed, today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I will say thank y'all for coming, even though you probably was coming for the president, but I appreciate it. Uh, um, and also, anybody else in this room, they stay with your reservation and came today as well. So, we really appreciate it. Um, we'll get started. Uh, as Kevin said, Dr. Stratton Jr. serves as our Vice President for Community Engagement here at the University. Uh, I tell people all the time I have one of the best jobs on campus, but I think ever. Uh, you know, when you think about a good day, a good day can consist of having every green light as you get up to ride, you have some good breakfast in the morning, they get any stops, the kids got up, everyone's on time, you're punctual. You think about that good day. And I often say that that good day is my day as it relates to my role here at the university. I have excellent people that I have the chance to work with day in and day out, colleagues across the board. I have people that have institutional knowledge that share that expertise with faculty, staff, and students. And then I have individuals that sacrifice and give more of themselves than others to make sure the university is what it can be, but continue to grow them to all it can be. I also greatly appreciate that across the board. Uh, so I have a brief couple of slides I'm going to show you that will give you some additional facts as it relates to the university and the, some of the work we're doing. And the best thing about today is with the q and I'm not alone. So if I don't know the answer, I know somebody in this space probably does know the answer. Uh, so that's the best thing right. Uh, but we're, what really brought me here today at the university, um, I've been here for uh, almost five years now. I came from the University of Alabama. I'm a military grad. I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, my parents, we traveled extensively, domestically, as well as internationally. And then my parents settled down in a small country town in Abbeville, Alabama, when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, culture shock, to say the least, uh, but the tools, the assets, everything I learned during my time in Alabama has prepared me to be 
who I am today. And I say that to say that oftentimes the seeds that are planted that we may not be aware of are oftentimes preparing us for our journey moving forward. So being from Alabama, coming here today and standing before you as a product of my parents, everything I've, I had the chance to do, um, just to be honest, a pure faith on my life that I've had the chance to have. So very appreciative of that. So quickly, community engagement at the university. Uh, when you think about community, when you think about the university, I deal with community as a subset, individuals, groups coming together for a shared good. That's kind of how we view it. The Office of Community Engagement serves the entire university. Uh, but we're kind of it. We have your academic units here at the university. You have your divisions here at the university. And our office, and I say our, because again, it's a group effort to make these things happen. It's really to make sure that there's a reciprocity that exists, a mutual benef beneficial relationship between the university and the community. And that can way at times. So we really look at it from three different distinct areas. Oftentimes we talk about the university as an R1 institution. So when I say that, it's a research one tier university. We operate at the highest research capacity that can exist for our institution. In addition to that, we are Carnegie engaged, meaning that the community engagement work that we do is recognized nationally and internationally. And there's only a subset of universities around Amy that have that designation as R1 and community engaged. And I also say that's a process that you go through every five years, and we're going through that process now to be reaffirmed and reclassified as Carnegie Engaged. And that's a group effort from the School of Engineering to the College of Business to every academic unit, staff, student, and faculty member here on campus to make sure we get that designation, but also make sure that it's recognized and action based throughout the community through and through. From our mission statement at the university, providing engaged service and outreach that improve the quality of life for local and global communities. We are the Metropolitan University, Metropolitan University here in the state of Kentucky. That's us. That's what we do. That's how we move. We're urban. We recognize that. But in addition to that, we have the opportunity to outreach within the city, but also outside the city as well. And that's something that President Schatzel is truly working on to make sure that we're doing that work in an impactful way. And I'm being remiss to say, and I'm going to open up with it, that President Schatzel does give her remarks for, for her regards for not being here today. Um, Frankfurt called, and she had the answer. So on that day, that's where she is right now um, in Frankfurt. But also, our strategic plan. As we know, strategic opportunities, strategic plans are essential for any business. Higher education, whether you look at it or not, it's a public good, but also there's a set of private gains that exist within it. So within our strategic plan, we're part of Connect. We're learn, work, connect, discover. Connect emphasizes the community engagement side of the house. So I'm really giving you all a deep dive of what we do internally and how we really approach community engagement here at the university. So we have strategic priorities. So you have strategic planning, you got to have priorities that build that out. As you can see here, our partnerships, we have to make sure that we're anchor mission and workforce development we'll talk about. We track our data and we have programming initiatives. Not to bore you too much, but these areas really cement how we move forward in a strategic way. Because if you have no plan, you can't succeed in that aspect. So we really want to make sure that we're on board and doing this day in and day out. So four core areas of community engagement. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to stay stationary right now, but it'll be all right. Uh, education attainment, economic development, two key pillars in which how we work and what we do, as well as health and quality of life and social human services. So when you think about a foundation, uh, our business leaders in here, you got to have core areas and themes that you're situated within. If not, you're going to be everywhere. We're a university, we're a powerhouse, we're an anchor institution, but we have to make sure that we're operating in fashion in which people recognize us for and our brand, but we're also impactful. Many times you have a lot of breath, but not a lot of depth in these type of areas. So we want to make sure that we're consistent in both of those regions, breath and depth. And by doing that, we're education attainment, economic development, health and quality of life, and social and human services. So when you think about the work that we're doing across the board, we're really setting, about setting up ourselves for success to make sure we have breath and we have depth. So if you have conversations, you're thinking about what we're doing from the university standpoint, these are our four core areas that we're doing now. So major partners. Um, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a business, these are major 
nonprofit organization for the most part that we work with from the university standpoint. By far, JCBS should be one of our most important. Our office really does the data for the university as it relates to community engagement. Not entirely that, but as it relates to community engagement, it's situated in the work that we do. I see Henry Sprinting, so it's a little small, Henry. You know, I see your eyes, yeah, it's a little small. Uh, but we'll make sure this is sent out as well. Uh, but this situates us around our major partners for the university and the work we're doing. And there's a lot of writing here, and it really looks like activities. When we think about activities, uh, I really want to boil down to it. Uh, you have MLK Elementary in the West End of the world. This is one of the lowest performing schools in the state of Kentucky, and literally probably five to seven miles from the university's outreach. And when you think about literacy levels within MLK Elementary, and within that, there are studies that say by third grade, if you can't read, going to prison is a high, highly likely probable outcome for you during that time. So as a university, we will look at who we partner with at MLK Elementary to make sure they're focused on literacy. That can be a program or a partnership with the Decode Project. Who looks at literacy from all levels of K through third grade. And what we're doing in that work is supporting partners that are already within the school, doing that work and elevating their practice through research, through scholarship, through volunteering for students, but making sure that we're impacting in a way that our work is just not sustainable. Many times when you look at partnerships, they coexist with people. So when somebody transitions out of the role, that partnership falls flat. So what we're looking at is making sure that the partners that we're working with are connected to a nonprofit organization from a sustainability standpoint to really make some things happen. So that's kind of a small example, a micro level, of the work that we can do while we're collaborating, coordinating, doing through. <coughs> Next is our scope, our, our frame of reference. Uh, so again, it's very small. But on this left side here, these are all the different partnerships that we have across the university of things that we're working with. As you know, the university is large. So when I say that, we have academic units, School of Engineering, Arts and Sciences, School of Business, College of Education, Kent School of Social Work, and I can go on and on. Then we have an HSC side, School of Nursing. We also have a med school, a dental school, a public health. So as you can see, a lot of complexities exist within that, but also a lot of moving parts and pieces. So we may have multiple people working in one school, but not centrally connected. So part of the responsibility is to make sure that people understand not only where they are and what they're doing, but also who is there, is to make sure that the scope of the work is known, but also really the impact is also happening as well. And then we also have increasing needs across the state. So working with different members of our team to make sure that those needs and we're being responsible for those needs are extremely important. And the only way to do that is through coordination and collaboration. Uh, also outside, the slide doesn't really project as much as it could, but there's a lot of work going on. We have a number of alumni across the board that are doing phenomenal things, and capturing that work and partnerships are extremely important as so much we're working on. What you're seeing before you is a survey. So you do work, you assess your work, you evaluate your work, but you also want to better understand what people are saying about the work that you're doing. Um, so our office is responsible for course-based learning. This is, say, Dr. Michael Martis is teaching a class, and he wants to involve, involve students in some type of service learning approach. And within that, what does that look like? So these are students that get out to the community, get in their three to four credit hours, doing impactful work. So we do surveys with those students. Also, our community partners. If we're working with you as a community partner, we want to know how we're doing. We want to make sure that our work is meaningful and impactful. And then our faculty standpoint. You know, faculty are the backbone in the university from a research, scholarship, and teaching standpoint, is not only recognized, but also it's needed to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do with the elevation and transfer of knowledge, but also just being a part of the, of the students' day-to-day -day activity. Our faculty are very, very important within that. So we have the chance to make sure that we're getting feedback and improving. None of us are perfect. There's always work to do. So within that, getting that is extremely important to us. That's a quick snapshot. I just wanted to run through that to give y'all an idea of that. Now, from my perspective, when I really begin to think about community engagement and the importance of community engagement, it doesn't stay within the four walls of the ivory towers of the university. That's first and foremost. So when we think about getting out into the community and the subset of the work that should be completed, UML is a brand in its own right. I think everyone here can agree with that. 
But oftentimes that brain can fall flat if the work being done isn't a sustainable type of work from a scholarship and research standpoint. But also you gotta have people, you gotta have capacity, but you gotta have partnerships. You gotta remove egos, you gotta remove self-interest, and you gotta think about what's for the best and the betterment of the community we serve. I shout out Mr. Dan Hall and the work that really started within community engagement here at the university. For many of you may not know, but our office has only really been around maybe for 15 to 17 years. So over that time span, a lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears have been dedicated to the efforts, but it's really up to individuals in our office now to take those seeds that were planted to take the work next level. And the only way we can do it is by the business leaders, community leaders here in this room today, Make sure that we're connected to the work that you're doing to elevate it and take it to the next level. Uh, but also to be compassionate, to be committed, to be transparent, and to be open to make sure that we're doing things in a way that everyone feels comfortable, feels connected, but also just feels that the work that we're doing is just not centered on a particular individual or person or landscape. It's for the better of everyone that's there in their regards. So community engagement isn't a one-stop shop. It isn't just a buzzword that we use just to say that we're checking off a box or doing something important. It's embedded in everything that we do. And outside of community engagement, there's a high level of service that exists. And I just want to paint the picture of the notion of engagement to service. Um, engagement involves that teaching, learning, and scholarship and service and the research side of it. I'm sorry. And it's very important to make sure that designation and that difference is there. Uh, because if it isn't, it's just service. And service has a high level of the work that we do as well. But we've got to make sure not only are we engaged, but the community is engaged as well. That's kind of the next thing I'll end with, is that when you're working with a community, oftentimes the voice can be forgotten or left off. Many times from a university standpoint and our business standpoint, our industry standpoint, you enter a space knowing or having an idea of what is needed, but you don't take into account the people that live and their day-to-day -day experiences within that area. And oftentimes, particularly in the West End and other underserved areas, we go on with an idea, we make a mark, we put a band-aid on the moon, and then sometimes we leave. Funding may dry up, people may leave, but we don't really get to the heart of the matter. And that's why many times things become systemic, they become generational, and a legacy of loss continues to occur year after year after year after year. And I believe that the university has a responsibility to not do band-aid work, but do sustainable work that heals wounds, that takes care of chronic illnesses, and does the stuff that many times people feel lost. I mean, for those who don't know it, the university has been around 225 years. So within that, you know, there's things that we've done well, there's things that we can improve upon, but it all takes everyone in this space to make sure these things happen. I may go on the reach, but I'll say probably 80, 85% of people in this room are University of Louisville fans. Um, so within that, our graduates, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, within that, I may have a child that goes here. You know, or, or your spouse may have gone here, or your best friend, or family, whatever the case may be. Um, so the work that we do is just not for now, it's just not for our generation, it's for all that we do. So when we're involved in the community in those conversations, when we're making sure that everyone feels that whatever the empty chair is at the table, that that voice is being recognized when we're thinking outside of ourselves, is extremely impactful, but also extremely important too. So a few things I just want to share uh, that I think are important as it relates to community engagement and research is we set a record this year for $230 million of research expenditures for the fiscal year for 2022, I'm sorry. So that goes with the spec. When I say $230 million, these are grants, these are publications, these are dollars that are coming to the university for a meaningful way and a very, very good way. Um, Ms. Brown, you know, I, to, I guess I'm following her. Ms. Brown, I tell my mom and dad, mom, we made it. I'm following Ms. Brown in the speech. But uh, as it relates to the Environment Institute, um, that institute is doing a lot of work around health equity. And the dollars that are involved in that process um, are a meaningful way for a sustainable time moving forward as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier about us being one of 80 institutions that are R1 and currently engaged. Uh, that's a big feat. That's a bragging point, but it also is an accountability point. So we're just not saying that, but what are we doing with that designation to make sure that we're doing it in a really good way. 
Uh, we're also part of the Association of Black and Black Grand Universities. I'm sorry, it's Innovation Economic Prosperity University. So this is another designation. So for those that may not be centrally connected to higher ed, getting designations and these type of things is a good thing. But also maintaining these things is the even better thing. So once you get the designation, it just doesn't stop there. It really is where the work begins at and continue doing it across the board. Other things that come to mind is our Trigger Institute and our relationship with Republic Bank and the great work we're doing about anti-aging. Um, at some point, part of life is getting older and growing. So within that, we want to make sure that we're in our best shape and our best self um, when that happens. Uh, we have a number of certificate programs as it relates to the work that we're doing across the board, our relationships with UPS, uh, which is huge, GEA, the School of Engineering, our business school, and all things in between. So I say when I say we're community engaged, we're connected within our business community, our industry community, the work we're doing we're seeking to do is to elevate our research process, make sure that our students are part of internships, make sure our students are getting a feel for the real world and they're prepared once they leave this campus, and also make sure that our staff and faculty are involved internally and externally to the university moving forward. Um, so I would say that we're on our way, we're doing some great things, we have more room to grow, uh, but also within that, there's a great appreciation for everyone in the space today that I think takes time in your own individual communities to make difference, and that travels throughout the city, the state, and also the nation. So thank y'all for the time, I really appreciate it. You mentioned health equity. Health equity, a lot more publicity, a lot more awareness, you know, generally throughout the community. The success of any, any major city, any city really, is based on you know, how they engage the businesses, nonprofits, government, universities, college, uh, high schools, etc. If they don't do that well, they're not going to succeed as a, as a city. I'm just curious how much, other than like health equity, is going to work. Did COVID or in several, the past several years, was there more awareness of the need for better community engagement? Yeah, and I'll say yes for the short answer. Um, one thing I failed to mention is actually a grant that we have through the Atlanta focusing on health equity with the Atlanta Foundation and really centered on that health equity approach over a good number of years. So I think the original age of the grant was four or five years for about 16 million or something around there, John, around that much. So it's really focused on attendance of nutrition, uh, mental health, uh, social. Uh, learning and making sure that these students feel a part, but also the Western community in general knows they need the help the most. But as it relates to COVID, and, and Dean Martin can speak to this too, that was a huge loss of learning for, for anyone that has kids, elementary school, middle school, high school during the COVID time. So within that, the mental health side, I think is really um, exacerbated, so to speak, um, as it relates to the needs of the students. And I also think there was a, a higher level of empowerment of people being more vocal about what their needs are, how those needs should be fulfilled, and where they feel like the gaps existed around that. So a lot of our community partners, our foundations, also see that in the work that they have. But we also see it here on campus where there's a different type of student that's coming on campus than say compared to even five or ten years ago. The way that they learn, the way the expectations around living accommodations, how they expect to take classes. Um, I know a large I think 80% of our students, our freshman students, have a class online or something around that, and they'll be all wonderful. But also, in addition to that, we have a large population of students that are living on campus and take the majority of the classes online as well. But then on the other side of the house, there's people that miss that social engagement. They want to be in class, they want to be involved, they want to be on campus, they want to play club sports, they want to do intramural sports. So there's a large subset of how that affects as well as being away from people that I think is also engaged from community standpoint as well. So I think the desire to uplift and change the community, particularly from a social justice lens, really enacted that as well during the COVID time, and just the opportunity to make a difference in your own space. Okay. Any questions for the back? Also, helping to reduce 
uh, duplication and replication of efforts, um, and more so combining efforts. Because we all know we're stronger in numbers, we're stronger in parts across the board. Um, so I think one thing for my office standpoint is to continue to better understand the work that's already occurring in the community <laughs> and utilizing this wonderful intellectual access that we have here on campus to elevate the work moving forward. Um, so if you are a community leader, a nonprofit leader, you see deficits, you see things that you're, you're getting somewhere, but maybe a university can take you next level in doing that. Please let us know. And if it fits within those four budgets, education, attainment, economic development, social and human services, and health and quality of life, we're here to make that happen. If it's in the West End, we have a place-based West End initiative that's been here for at least 15 years. How can we help? We have a signature partnership initiative in which we work with five schools currently. Central High School Academy at Shawnee, West Fork Middle School, uh, Central, and Atkinson Elementary. And if you're doing work in those schools, how can we help? If it's anything related to STEM or business, how can Dean Collins and College Engineering be of help? How can Jonathan be of help? So if there's initiatives that are current and which the university can be helpful on, we're working on having more of a front door access to the university. Um, but within that, while we work on that, please reach out to myself, Dean Martis, Dean Collins, and we'll connect you to the right people to make things happen. Great question. Yes, sir. Sorry, Fred, I think you may have just answered my question. Uh, years ago, when I was directing the Cabbage Back Settlement House, mm -hmm. our first strategic planning session <coughs> was led by a professor of business school. And it was probably the best strategic planning session we had out of very, very many of the years. Um, that happened because somebody said, let's talk to you about all and see if they have something to come. And of course, we didn't have to pay anything, so I went off. Which was a great bonus. It was me years later as we did other sessions. We wanted to pay folks to do those kinds of things. Um, so, uh, community serving organization out there has a particular need. Mm -hmm. Do they just simply need to contact your office and say, can the university help with this? Is there a list somewhere of the sort of resources and services that you do, or is it more of uh, a. Yeah, so. We contact you and you. Great question. Yeah, so you can't go, it's like a U of L community engagement, and there's a number of things that will come up on that website. But I think one of the best ways to connect with someone is to have that conversation and that interaction to better understand that need. So contacting our office, definitely open to it and making it happen. And then from there, somewhere today, we don't have the answer, or if we can we can help direct you to the appropriate contact, whether it's the School of Business or any other academic unit, our student affairs, truly help in that regard. So yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Keith, one of the clients on the team. How are you doing? Doing well, how are you? Good, good, good. Um, so we talked about subset, like you well, it's at the top tier of accreditation. Mm -hmm. How many are there? Eighty. As a list of current. Eighty? Mm -hmm. Eighty total. Okay. So that eighty, I assume, are all very prominent. And, and so when you talk about racing, or climbing and also raising others, is there certain ways that you also work with other universities, kind of in K at that level? Mm -hmm. They're trying to build that. Yeah. Rising all the yeah. institutions at that, that, that level because clearly, uh, it's easy to have how many institutions are, that's not a lot, right? Uh, yeah. anyway, so, I guess you just see what you're trying to accomplish there as well. Yeah, great question. Uh, so, the AD ties into the institutions that are also R1, so research high intensive, uh, which means other criteria, doctoral, grad, medical school, things of that nature as well. But I will say, well, we're currently working with Bellarmine and Spalding and Simmons and some type of community engagement consortium of higher ed institutions here in the city. Because oftentimes, I'm about to oh, okay. congratulations. So within that, we want to make sure that the work we're doing is coordinated around partnerships of the different subsets of the cities that we're all doing work in. But if we're doing it more collaboratively, what does that look like? And how to produce and yield higher results? The subset of student population of Melbourne is doing great work, Spalding, Simmons, and UofL. But if we bring all that to a fold from a community engagement research standpoint, so I'm talking about anything from collaborating around events, around some of the fields of practice that are occurring, all the way to shared activities and cleanup days and things of that nature too. Um, so that's, work, that's what we're working on locally as well as the institutions to really build up a framework. Because I thought one day is actually to host one of the national conferences as well as the community engagement again, similar to 2013, I believe, in Kumu Band. And within that, 
bringing in the fold of other institutions here in the city to make it even bigger and better for a fresh You're welcome. And if you want one last task for you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, every year, most years, the Rotary Club has a, uh, a wine swap, just a, a social thing. We, I guess, bring, bring two bottles of wine and go back with one. You share the rest, share the others. Uh, but we have a, 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 a raffle here for a free scholarship to the wine party at our house this year. Next Friday, November 10th. You have to be over 18, though, so make sure that. Okay, the last four digits are 9767. This usually happens, I don't think we can't think of that. I'll use the second, that way. 9794. Thanks a lot.